Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to our April edition of the Ask the Expert webinar series. Um, it's 101. I'm just going to wait for probably another minute to give some of the last minute um, attendees some time to log in. And then we'll get started. Um, Okay, we've got the numbers um, quickly moving up, so this is a good sign. Okay, so just a couple of administrative notes before we get started. Um, audio, I have a message in the chat box about audio, but just to emphasize again that audio is through your computer, so it's recommended to plug in external speakers or headphones for um, best sound quality. If you're having problems with the computer audio, there is an option to switch to telephone. You just have to select telephone in your audio pod and follow the instructions, the phone number and the PIN number for that. Uh, a note about questions. So if you enter a question for um, anyone, unlike Adobe Connect, which you may be uh, more familiar with, the chat and question option is not public. So if you enter a question, only myself, the organizer, will see that. So just an FYI, it's not public. Um, but please send in your questions as we go throughout the webinar for our presenters. We welcome them at any time. Um, we'll first hear from Margaret Lumley, who is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Guelph. Um, so we'll hear from her first, and then we'll take questions for her uh, presentation. So feel free to submit those at any time. Um, after that, we'll hear, we'll hear from Bruno Mancini, who is the former director of Counseling and Accessibility Services at the University of Guelph. Um, so each of them will be telling us about their relevant transition program, one which occurred in the summer and one which was uh, a credit course for first-year students. Um, the webinar is also being recorded, so just an FYI, that will be made available on our uh, Center for Innovation for Campus Mental Health website at a later date. Um, so that's about it. Without further ado, I'm just going to take a moment to switch over to uh, Professor Margaret Lumley. Figuring out the technical thing here. Speaking of transition. There <laughs> <laughs> um, we go. Does that look right then? That looks good. Right. <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I, love, I work at the Department of Psychology at the University of Guelph and in our clinical developmental program. So I uh, really have a passion for mental health. and. Um, being involved in the creation and development of this course has um, really been one of the most inspiring parts of my work as of late. So I'm thrilled to be here today to um, share this with you. A little bit of a, a self-confession to start with. This is the first time I've actually done a webinar. I've done plenty of speaking, so it's a little bit different. I'm used to uh, having some back and forth with the folks that I'm speaking to, so this is a little bit different, but we'll, we'll do my best. So um, going back a few years ago, the University of Guelph applied um, for funding for a mental health, mental health initiative on campus to offer a course for students who are experiencing mental health challenges and um, were registered for this challenge um, with our student accessibility services. And um, we had to ask all kinds of questions like, what would we want this course to look like? How would we recruit students for the course? Um, what challenges might we anticipate for the course? And um, I, I suppose I'd like to turn this to you <laughs> in, an, as, in, in, in an interactive way for you to think about that question, you know, with, can you envision such a course wherever you happen to be, and what kinds of challenges might you face? Um, do you think that this might be a good idea for your setting? And perhaps after I share a little bit more with you this afternoon um, about the course, you could think about that a little bit more. So this was really a collaborative 
uh, joint project with uh, Student Accessibility Services and the Department of Psychology. And at Guelph, we've had a course for several years um, for students who are coming into university with a learning disability. Uh, so we had a history of a course in which students were being um, referred and um, made known about the course through our support services and then a partnership with the Department of Psychology. So we took a similar sort of model and applied it um, to students with mental health challenges who we all know have um, really grown exponentially on campus in the last decade. So one of the first things after um, meeting with Bruno Mancini, who you're going to hear from a little bit later this afternoon, and hearing about the course and being asked, would you like to be involved? And I said, yes, <laughs> I really would. This sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Um, one of the first things they wanted to do was actually meet with students on campus and hear from them about what they would um, envision to be important for this kind of course. And so you'll see on your screen uh, some of the main themes that came out of the focus group that we had with these students. Um, they, they really wanted to promote a self-understanding of not feeling like a, a fraud, which is the language some of them used um, for receiving the supports and accommodations that they did. Um, they, wanted, they wanted to highlight that there really is flexibility in how students can travel through university. Um, and that, it's, that especially the more senior students reflected back on their time in university and, and, and wished that they had been a little bit more flexible in how they approached um, their courses, the number of courses taken, the sequence, um, and that they had been more at peace with that earlier on on their journey. Of course, knowing um, how to access the myriad of supports that are available at the University of Guelph um, on our campus and um, in the community as well as online was an important goal that students raised. Communication was a big one. How do we speak to each other? How do we speak to our peers about mental health challenges? What are the issues around self-disclosure? When do I want, um, you know, when should I self-disclose? How should I self-disclose? How do I communicate with parents about some of my challenges on campus when parents are just super keen for me to stay in five courses and along with my counselor and my mental health advisor, I'm realizing five courses is unmanageable for me. Um, how do I advocate for myself with my professors? How do I communicate best with them about the mental health challenges I experience? And um, certainly there was quite a bit of discussion about stigma. One thing I don't have on the slide, which also came out of this talk was that, that students were quite, or the focus group, students were quite also interested in this idea about we have all of these supports on campus and there are, you know, a myriad and it's grown over the last decade, again, the kinds of initiatives around student mental health on campus. Students were also interested in what next, like we're talking about transition from secondary to post-secondary, but students were also thinking ahead and thinking about what if, what's going to be there to support me as I transition into the workplace. Um, so that was another theme. Just very quickly, there was a whole approval process, you know, in any institution. <laughs> there was an approval process for a course that we needed to go through. Um, you can see that quickly on your slide. So after meeting with students um, in the focus group, I also um, met with uh, several stakeholders on campus, um, including um, folks that worked in counseling services, our mental health advisors that work more with students with mental health challenges in terms of their supporting their academics. Um, you know, I met with other mental health professionals. Um, we were lucky enough to have um, Heather Stewart, who is the um, Bell uh, Research Chair in, as many of you may know, um, at Queen's, who does research on stigma, came to visit. I spoke to her extensively about the course. and just really tried to get feedback and input from lots of people. So at the end of the day, <laughs> um, in terms of the overarching goals of the course, you can see here uh, to promote both the scholarly and applied understanding and enhancement of mental, wealth, or mental health and well-being for undergraduate students on campus. We wanted to decrease um, self-stigma. And we know from research that, that, that self-stigma, stigma turned in towards the self is a really um, potent barrier in terms of accessing support. And we really wanted to promote 
self-efficacy, positive coping, um, and really providing an opportunity to orient students to all of the supports that were available, um, both on campus and in the broader community, including online. So one of the big questions, I wonder if some of you may have thought this great from the outset, um, and certainly this was one of the first questions when speaking about the course, people said, is this not just a group therapy? How is this different from, from therapy um, or other mental health supports, which we already have on campus? And as you can see here, I have as number one, it's evaluative. So it is a course, it's a credit course. Um, there is work involved that is evaluated, there's feedback. So that's a major difference um, in terms of therapy. Uh, students have the opportunity to earn a credit. So I taught the course in its first offering, and I did have a, a couple of students in the course that had yet, because of the severity of their mental health challenge and other issues, to earn a credit. And so for a couple of those students, this was the, the first credit that they were able to earn and hopefully gain some skills to apply to other courses um, towards their academic uh, success. There's also, in the course, a much greater educational focus than we find in most therapeutic interventions. Of course, therapeutic interventions can have psychoeducation as a, as a big part of them, but certainly being a course, a uh, psychology course, there is more of an educational focus than we would typically find in intervention. Another big difference is this idea of um, different levels of disclosure. So this was a really big one. Uh, I'll tell you, it honestly cost me a few sleepless nights. Um, before the first class, thinking about how to manage uh, levels of, of disclosure and how to model and make this a safe, comfortable place where students felt able to disclose um, in a positive, useful way and not in a triggering, um, highly distressing way. And in a way, hoping to take some of the best aspects from a group uh, therapeutic intervention in which um, ideally people feel that sense of belongingness, connection, like they're heard, like they have a voice, wanting to have those positive, um, powerful effects in the class, um, but recognizing that this is, again, an educational, evaluative setting um, and wanting to make sure that students felt safe. So managing self-disclosure was one of my biggest concerns going into the course, um, and it actually was one of those things that I probably worried about way more than I needed to, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, also, I think that potentially, and this may be my bias, so I'll put that right out there, I'm a real pr proponent of positive mental health, um, but I really think that this course has a large focus on building well-being, even among students who are struggling with mental illness, so really, um, again, it depends on the kind of intervention, but many interventions tend to be more deficit-based, there's nothing wrong with that in the sense of how can we address you know, this anxiety or, um, you know, self-harm behavior or whatever the issue is, whereas um, this course did have a little bit of uh, mental health literacy component, but there really was a huge focus on building positive mental health. And, so timely to show uh, Corey Key's model, which probably most of you are familiar with, this, this idea about um, well-being really lying on two continuous, so one being mental illness um, and the other mental health. And um, this model was introduced to students at the very beginning of the course and repeated throughout the course as a reminder that regardless of where we may lie in terms of our mental illness, um, you know, where our anxiety may be, our depression, other issues that we're experiencing, we still have the opportunity um, to not only work on those challenges, but also to build their mental health. And again, um, being a psychology course, I also look to positive psychology um, for some of the theoretical sort of underpinnings of the course as well as some of the content. So some of you may be familiar with um, Martin Seligman and Chris Peterson's work around um, human strengths and the best things about life and humanity and his um, theory about well-being. So Seligman thought that, or you know, his position that there are many sort of pillars of well-being or roots to well-being, um, being what we can remember with the acronym PERMA, the positive emotions, you know, the, um, joy, uh, happiness, contentment, etc. 
And we know from all kinds of psychology research how important positive emotions are for learning. This is what yeah, um, Barbara Friedrichson's research on broaden, her broaden and build theory on how positive emotions expand our thinking, allow us to think creatively, um, think of flexibility. We know when we're experiencing mental illness that flexibility tends to suffer greatly. Our options really narrow and uh, positive emotions and learning about how we might facilitate positive emotions in our lives, even when we're experiencing uh, mental health challenges, can really help to um, increase our flexibility. Engagement is a big one. So um, we ask students to think about what are the things in life that, that give you that sense where you lose track of time, where you're really interested in something, uh, where you can't wait to get back to it. Um, and we know that engagement is one way to promote well-being. There was a focus on relationships in the course, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but again, around communication, um, connecting with peers, uh, building more, like um, increasing interpersonal kind of relationship skills, meaning. So we asked students in the course to think about their core values, their beliefs, try to bring more of that, align their life more with some of those core things that are very important to them, and accomplishment. So, um, some have criticized Seligman's theory for not including a V. Uh, in, so we have PERMA. I just briefly went through that with you. V would be vitality, which would speak to um, more of the physical aspect of well-being, which we actually did cover in the course as well. So things like sleep and nutrition, for example, being also very foundational for well-being. Okay, there. I'm, that's sort of a little bit of background. I guess I'm going to pick up the pace here a little bit. Um, so we've offered the course now three times. Um, the first time we offered it was in the fall um, of 2014, I believe. Uh, then we offered it winter 2015. And now we've just completed offering it in winter of 2016. And um, I believe it's slated now to be offered uh, regularly by the university. So when we initially offered the course, all this work went into the development of it. Um, and what I want to say is different than a typical course is that it really was a collaborative, as I pointed out, the beginning venture in the sense that when I developed the course, I worked quite a bit with um, Bruno Mancini, who you're going to hear from in a moment, and also the mental health advisors. And we de devised a system to figure out how to connect with students who are registered with a mental health challenge to inform them about the course and then to handle um, the requests from students to take the course. And honestly, our first offering, we struggled a little bit um, in terms of, you know, we were trying to inform students in the summer about a course starting in the fall. We were really targeting as first-year students. They had all the normal developmental anxieties about attending university and, um, you know, some programs have more flexibility than others in terms of courses and, and so on. So we ran into a few challenges in the first offering in terms of first-year students. But every offering that we've had since, our challenge has been the opposite in the sense that we've had more students wanting to take the course um, and really wanting to keep the course capped um, at 30 students. So um, that's been our challenge more so than finding the students is, is that there are too many students really um, to take the course. So um, again, you know, I don't have tons of time today and I'm very happy if anyone wants to send me an email um, to send you any information I can, more detail about the course, I'm happy to share the syllabus. I'll be honest, I, I guess I've been drinking my own Kool-Aid, but um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the course and, and reactions to it, but I, I do think that it's a unique and um, potentially a one approach to, to, a potentially powerful approach to really reach students who are struggling with um, mental health challenges on campus. And I would love to see this course or a similar course offered um, at other institutions, so I'm happy to share any materials that might facilitate that. So in terms of the central goals, again, increase positive mental health, so that you know, the positive aspects of well-being. Really uh, focus on self-reflection, the big part of the course. And we wanted the course itself, the way that it was set up, to um, decrease self-stigma, because we know stigma is so powerful in terms of barriers um, to you know, advocating for self, seeking assistance when you need it, and so forth. 
and we really also hope that the course would have the kinds of tools that would help students to increase their academic self-efficacy. There were was, there was a couple of major assignments in the course and then some more minor assignments. So a major assignment that sort of just staged across the course was an individual learning and well-being plan. So there's this joint focus on the academic context in terms of what are my mental health challenges, how are the, how um, are they going to impact my learning in different kinds of courses? What kinds of challenges might I anticipate? Um, we had an assignment where students wrote a hypothetical advocacy email to a professor, that sort of thing. Uh, but really reflecting on your, your personal learning, but also your well-being challenges and strengths, um, and how you might draw on those strengths to get through those difficult times that inevitably we are all going to encounter. There also was a final presentation or project on mental health, and um, of course we, it was interesting because quite a few of the students had significant anxiety issues, and for them, um, at the beginning of the class, the idea of standing up in front of the class doing any kind of presentation or drawing attention to oneself in such a way was utterly terrifying, um, and of course there were other options for students. Not everyone had it wasn't required to do the presentation. But one of the most powerful things for me was to see how many students actually at the end of the day did feel safe enough um, in this context to choose to do a presentation. I'm thinking of one young man in particular who barely spoke a word for the first probably eight, ten weeks of the, you know, the very, like, almost all the way through the course. He was always there. Um, you could see by his visual engagement that he was engaged in the material and he listened. Um, and he actually got up and talked about his social anxiety um, in the final presentation. We had another student um, speak about her experience working with service dogs uh, for students or for her mental health challenge. And she made a video that was incredibly powerful. Um, students made websites. I mean, they just did really incredible things, and um, that was that was another big project. So, we've talked a little bit about how this is different from typical or from group therapy. How is it difficult, different? How is this course different from typical courses? Um, it depends on your setting. I I know well, so we always strive to find places to offer small seminar type classes, but uh, they tend to be <laughs> becoming fewer and further between. But the, especially for first year students. Um, we do have a first-year seminar program at Guelph, but again, not, not every student has that opportunity. But for these students to come into their first year, potentially, or even in upper years, and have the opportunity to be in a smaller seminar-like class is, is a positive experience for many of them. Um, there is a large, um, the evaluation component is really participation-based. And after much <laughs> going back and forth, we decided on a pass-fail format um, with a certain percentage of participation in terms of assignments completed to make that assessment. Um, and really a, a main focus was on positive self-development, necessarily not necessarily a certain amount of knowledge acquisition. Um, this is a very experiential course. We had guest speakers come into the course, um, experts in different areas around stigma, for example. And um, students, it was made clear to students that they would benefit more if they participated and engaged more. There were several individual assignments that students completed. You can see some listed here. Again, I'm happy to provide the syllabus for anyone who wants more detail about these kinds of assignments. Um, I do want to say that towards their individual well-being and learning plan, students did complete the Values in Action or VIA survey online. You know, about again, um, developed by um, Feldman and Peterson. And part of it was to really develop an understanding of their personal strengths. Students who experience mental health challenges often have focused a fair amount on what their challenges and difficulties are. Um, and for many of them, they reported that this was a novel experience for them to think about themselves in different ways. Okay, I've already talked about that. <laughs> so that's a little bit about the course. And now I'm just um, briefly going to go over a little bit about, about some research that we've done in the course. So paired with the course offering all along the way, we've been um, collecting data to really see um, you know, what, how the students are responding to the course, what's working, maybe what's not working as well, um, and just to understand um, more about the research that, could, that would help us make decisions about this course. So um, 
we have more data right now, but the, we're not, we haven't analyzed it all in this recent offering, but basically the data I'm presenting now is based on 45 participants, uh, 17 to 25 years old, plus two mature students um, that took the course. And you can see the breakdown in terms of uh, first year. Most of the students had taken medication at some point for their mental health challenge. Many had been hospitalized and almost all reported a DSM diagnosis. And you'll see lots of anxiety and depression as well as other uh, mental health challenges. So um, we collected these data in the first and the last class. Participation in the research part of this was voluntary. And participants did receive um, $10 for participating. I, I want to go back and say in terms of the challenge, <laughs> when we initially conceptualized this, of course we would like, we wanted to have a control group. We wanted to recruit uh, students who were um, registered with their mental health challenge through Student Accessibility Services, uh, but not taking the class. And we went to quite elaborate lengths to do so, um, but ran into all kinds of typical challenges that we have when recruiting participants from a clinical setting, which is that as much as mental health advisors really believed in doing this, that just um, was feeling quite overwhelmed um, by the work that they have on their plate already. This is not necessarily always the top priority. Then also feeling like when students are coming to see them, they're highly distressed, so it's not necessarily the best time to say, well, why don't you participate in this research study about a course that you're not taking? Um, so we ran into, and I could go on, but we ran into quite a few challenges. So um, let's take that as an important caveat about the data that I'm about to show you. They really um, reflect the group of students who took the course, not necessarily compared to a control group. So we were interested in um, you know, whether participating in the class would be associated with improvements in student well-being. It's one thing to say that we're targeting increased positive mental health. Is there any evidence of that? Any evidence in terms of improvements in coping strategies, accessing resources? Was there any reported reduction in self-stigma and um, improvements in academic self-efficacy? You can see on your screen um, a quote that uh, you'll see a few of these from students. Um, because our sample size is quite small, I think also the qualitative analysis of these data actually is quite powerful as well. So with that said, I'll show you a few. <laughs> quantitative outcomes. So we did find um, from time one to time two increases in resilience, um, so self-reported resilience, and decreases in depression. And in terms of positive self-use, uh, we used a measure of positive schemas that we actually developed in our lab that looks at um, beliefs about self around self-efficacy, that um, you know, success, interpersonal trust, worthiness, and optimism. And we found um, changes in a positive direction for FDC self-efficacy, worthiness, and optimism from the beginning to the end of the course. <clears throat> and we also found significant uh, decreases in different aspects of internalized stigma, uh, or in different as aspects of stigma, including what we were most interested in, which was internalized stigma from the start to the end of the course. And we found um, that students were more likely to report using instrumental support, being able to positively reframe situations and using humor from the start to the end of the course. So overall, again, big caveat, small sample size. Um, but you know, the effect sizes of these results were actually you know, medium to large, most of them. So even though it was a small sample size, I think some of these effects may be robust. Um, again, we don't have a control group. <laughs> but overall, a very positive, if you just look at the overall pattern, sort of in the same direction. Um, and oh, I did want to report here that we were interested in targeting academic self-efficacy. And I, didn't, I don't have a slide showing that. But we didn't really see changes in terms of self-reported academic self-efficacy in the questionnaire that we used, which wasn't the best questionnaire, I'll just say. Um, but where we did see a lot of evidence of improved self-efficacy um, was in our qualitative data, which I'm going to speak about now. So um, along with my graduate students, uh, Sophia Fenergiakis and uh, Christy Bouton, who have both been involved in this course um, in some way or another, either as teaching assistants. Oh, that was something I didn't mention, actually. I'll just pause there for a moment to say 
um, the way we structured the course is a seminar course, and um, there's an instructor, and then two um, teaching assistants who are senior clinical psychology students. Um, so in their PhD, usually the senior years of their PhD. And um, the first time we ran it, we had two half TAs. I mean, I, I know different institutions have different ways of um, denoting hours for a TA ship, but basically half TAs. Um, and then we have run it since with only one half TA. Okay, so, and that was also provided um, just additional support in terms of uh, working with students through some of their challenges around assignments and that sort of thing. Also, more support for facilitating the participatory nature of the class. And um, I think it's also offered an incredibly um, wonderful opportunity for the senior PhD students who have had the opportunity to work on the course as well. So our analysis of what students had to say about the course, um, I'll tell you about a few themes that came forward. So definitely this sense of belonging and stigma reduction was a big one, um, which made me quite happy. <laughs> um, as I said from the outset, you know, we were hoping to have some of the best aspects of a group intervention in the sense of that, 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 that um, feeling of a shared experience of being heard, of having a voice, being understood. You know, you can read, I won't read what the student said. Um, does everyone have to have a screen or do some people, are they only listening? No, they should all, they have, should a all have a screen. Yeah. So I'll let you see what the students had to say there. And as I said, another theme that really came out was academic self-efficacy. Um, so students told us that they learned new coping strategies and tools um, that Doing, you know, that doing some of these small group activities and feeling like they could do that, they could speak in a small group in this class. They felt supported. They felt they could apply that um, to their other classes, which may be a thing that they had struggled with. And um, again, you know, I think that students talked about being able to take the learning about themselves, but also about you know, how to, how to promote resilience in their life, how to cope with challenges when they come up, and hearing other student stories about how they've done that, it's that whole idea of broadening a repertoire or having more flexibility um, to approach the challenges that all students are going to face in university. And then, of course, the challenges that come along with um, having a mental health challenge in particular, which add to that. So definitely another theme is around um, just personal development and coping, um, how to be a successful student, having improved well-being, um, looking at the good parts of my life. Um, it was very touching to hear students um, speak in the class and talk about how they were starting to see themselves a little bit differently through the eyes of their peers in the class and perhaps through some of the material that they were encountering. So. Um, I've already mentioned some of the challenges that we experienced. Um, certainly initially, that first semester, we found it challenging to, to solicit first year students um, and figuring out what are the, you know, and then and bridging with that transition from secondary to post-secondary and getting the information to the right people. And I think um, when Bruno Mancini speaks shortly, he, he may mention some of that. Um, so there was, you know, it was a little rough at first about making some of those decisions. Um, I know the mental health advisors struggled a little bit sometimes with um, how to advise students who they maybe had some suspicion that this kind of group dynamic, group class may be challenging for. I have to say, though, that um, we basically took, we, as much as there was some talk about, well, you know, should there be some selection criteria or this sort of thing, um, we decided to put that aside and um, really to focus on sort of first come, first serve um, in terms of registration for the class um, because, you know, we really felt that if students really felt strongly like this was the class that they wanted to take and they did have a, a mental health challenge that we really wanted to um, give them the opportunity, so that's what we decided to do. And in terms of challenges in the course, definitely attendance was one, or is one, that is challenging. 
Um, there, was, there, there were some students who attended just you know, religiously, <laughs> regularly. Uh, there were other students who chronically struggled with attendance. We shifted the timing of the class. Initially, I think it was, offer, it was offered at 10.30 in the morning, which was too early for quite a few students who struggled with sleep related to their mental health challenge um, or medication issues or others. So we've shifted it to midday, but we also were thoughtful in the sense that we wanted the class to end um, with enough time for students to get drop-in um, counseling support services or walk-in services, so if they needed that. Um, so that was definitely a struggle for some students and figuring out as an instructor the appropriate amount of um, kind of challenge and support around attendance was, was something that I had to work through. Um, assignment completion, again, finding appropriate accommodation while maintaining the integrity of the course. And it is a credit course, so how much, and it is a pass-fail course, so uh, working with students around that. What I did find is a few students who had um, major crises or mental health crises were still able to get the course at an independent pace a little bit later in the semester. That did happen for a few students. So having the flexibility to work with that, um, but also wanting to maintain uh, integrity for the course. So that, that was a bit challenging. And <clears throat> some students did not really appreciate um, the pass-fail nature of the course, which would you know, show up like a practicum course or, or other courses are like that at the university that um, either passed or failed. But some students, especially those super high achieving students, really would have rather earned a 99% in um, like 1400. <laughs> so that you know was a challenge. But I think at the end of the day, most students um, felt that the pass fail format allowed them to relax into the content of the course a little bit more. And then the nature of the content of the course um, did not really lend itself to a graded evaluation. I'm going to wind up here shortly and turn it over to Steve Bruno. Um, you know, most people really predicted that one of the major issues with the class would be overdisclosure or problems with self-disclosure. And that, I have to say, um, and it surprised me as well because that was something I worried about, we really took time in the first couple of classes to set up a lot of guidelines and, and get input from the students around self-disclosure. We talked a lot about self-disclosure in the class, and it really um, did not become to be become an issue. In the three offerings of the course, <clears throat> there's been twice that we've had to take a student um, from the class over to walk-in support services, um, which again, given the severity of some of the mental health challenges that students are coping with, I think that it's not an alarming number. So take-home messages, um, we really are excited, we've been excited today to share with you a little bit about Psych 1400 and this course. Um, so far, there have been approximately 90 students at the University of Guelph, Guelph with mental health challenges that have taken this course and earned a credit um, and hopefully walked, walked away from the course with um, skills for building their well-being, seeing themselves in a more flexible, positive way, and having um, self-efficacy to face the challenges they're going to face um, at university and in their broader life. And at least at this point, um, as far as I know, we're, we're continuing to offer this course into the future at Wells. And it's one of the many myriad of um, support intervention programs, et cetera, that are available on campus to support students. Um, and it's a novel one in the sense that it's really a collaboration between an academic department um, and then support services more broadly. Um, so we did get one question. Did you want to take that now, or? Sure. Okay. So we had a question from Queen's University Residence Life. Um, they're wondering if the content for the first year seminar is different than that of the upper year seminar. Excellent question. So one of the things that we changed. So I, we talked quite a bit about um, the challenges with the first year. So what we did in that first offering is that we had class where the first year and then the upper year students attended together and then we broke into two separate seminars on the so the second day of the week. So Tuesdays was class, Thursdays we broke into two seminars. We only did that for one term. One of the changes that we made after that, so the second two offerings, was we just decided to open it to students at all levels and um, and to stay together for the seminar component. So um, 
that was one of the changes that we made. We found that there were some advantages to having first-year students on their own for that really small um, <coughs> seminar component. But then students were giving us the feedback after that first offering that they really thought they would rather be together and that they would learn, there was more learning that could happen that way. So we, we changed the uh, format. Okay, so we just got another question. Uh, will you be completing any long-term studies on the effect of the course on mental well-being and academic success? Yeah, so I mean the data that I provided today are quite preliminary really. Um, we have a lot of information um, from students. We also have um, in the ethics application, we also asked for consent um, to access um, student um, grades. So I'm not sure. We'll have to, you know, make some decisions about what exactly we're going to follow up on. But we definitely plan to um, look over the long term. We also have. Um, we've also what I didn't present today is that we also have a. So we had time one, time two. We also have a time three where we followed up with students more on the qualitative aspect for them to report on, you know, several months after having taken the course, um, what they're left with. So I think that will be interesting to look at as well. Okay. Um, somebody else is uh, curious about how you found students for the course and did they self-identify? Excellent question. So um, our student accessibility services, um, Bruno Mancini, you're going to hear from shortly if I don't keep talking. and. Um, uh, also, our mental health advisors um, created uh, flyers. Um, we sent these out to um, high schools, also on, online, the University of Guelph website, um, and, and also through Student Accessibility Services. So you'll note that students took this course who were already registered or who you know, were becoming registered with their mental health challenge through our Student Accessibility Services. Um, so that's how students found out about the course. And then they self-selected in the sense that, oh, and I also offered um, like a one, like a brief one hour, or not even that long, half an hour. I, I a couple of times was willing to go and just speak about the course and answer any questions students might have when they were thinking about maybe registering for the course. So finding different ways to get information out about the course to students. I mean, one comment we did hear back when student, I had many students approach me wanting to take the course who had just heard about it somehow, but we're not registered with a mental health challenge, and that was, I mean, one of the difficulties that we had because some students just wanted to take it because they were really interested um, in the content, and but they didn't meet criteria for the course because it really was um, part of it that they were registered with their mental health challenge. Okay, so you've partly answered the next question, Okay, uh, which is someone's wondering, in the spirit of inclusiveness, if yeah. it was open to anyone or specifically yes. those with challenges. Yeah. So, <laughs> Bruno is going to speak next. He's heard me speak about this forever. I would, I would love to actually. I think there's, there's special things about having a course like this um, that is um, a safe place for people with lived experience to have to come together um, in the course. But I also think have, and we have a course at the University of Wealth that does focus a bit on well-being. But I think having this kind of course around mental health and well-being that's open to everyone, including students with a variety of experiences with mental health and mental illness. Um, would be an excellent future endeavor as well, absolutely. Great. Uh, so final question, um, is this a course that someone can suggest to their clients entering into post-secondary even if they do not attend uh, University of Guelph? Um, well, for all the folks that are out there from other institutions, you should think about offering a course like this. So if they're attending University of Guelph, absolutely. Um, other places may have um, something like this. And I'd love to hear about that if that's the case. Please send me an email, mlumley at um, But yeah, it, it would depend on the institution. Okay, great, thanks. So that's, um, we'll wrap up the questions for um, your presentation um, at this point so that we have a chance to get Bruno's in there and then if we have some more time at the end, we can just take open questions. Um, so thank you very much, Margaret. I'm just gonna take a moment to transition now over to our next presenter, which will be Bruno. I'm seeing me. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. There we go. So good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just trying to get my slides in order as well. And need a little help, of course, because it is to do with technology. 
Um, I just wanted to reiterate what um, um, Margaret mentioned earlier. Both of these projects, were, which were funded through the Mental Health Initiative Fund initially, are now core programs within the University of Guelph. Um, the course that Margaret discussed is actually being offered for the fourth time this year, or next year. And uh, the transition program that I will be speaking about uh, very briefly because of, of time constraints uh, is also now part of our core program. So it's great that we had the uh, opportunity to do these initiatives and uh, actually now move them into practice as part of our core services because both the research and, our, and the response of students to both these programs has been quite positive and we just felt that it was important to continue. So um, the, the, the context of this particular summer transition program, um, I know most universities and colleges offer summer transition programs for students. And uh, we at Guelph, uh, the University of Guelph, had our programs as well. But what we wanted to do with this project was to uh, develop a, a summer transition program um, that would, first of all, be partnered with our local community college, which is Conestoga and also to partner with our um, uh, local boards of education. Uh, the challenge in all of this transition work that we do is how do we communicate with um, school boards, post, uh, secondary schools, high schools, and, high, and how do we make the transition in terms of communication and relationship between the boards of education and the high schools and the university setting. So we wanted to explore that issue and we wanted to do it with a local community college just because of trying to understand the transition needs of college balanced students versus university balanced students. So it was an ambitious kind of agenda and to do that we had to have the cooperation of course of Conestoga and we worked very closely with Conestoga College and, and their staff as well as the uh, boards of education in our area. So essentially, in conversations with them, we came up with uh, some program objectives that um, you will quickly recognize um, and are very close to what Margaret spoke about in terms of the objectives of the course. Um, in many ways, this transition program is an attempt to integrate and make the transition not only for students to university, but between the programs within our university. So we wanted um, to certainly normalize the developmental experiences surrounding transition to post-secondary education. We, we, just, we wanted these, our students to be able to come in and uh, enter the university with a higher degree of confidence, less anxiety, uh, less stigma, and, and knowledge about services. And once again, many of these objectives are very clear and very similar to objectives of many uh, summer transition programs. But we went back to the high schools to find out and how to develop those programs. And uh, so we spent a lot of time in focus groups within the high schools with students, with uh, uh, secondary school teachers, and came up with a, a program, if you will, that essentially was three programs. <clears throat> These are fancy names, but I'll go through them very quickly. Launch Prep was actually a residential program that we ran at the University of Guelph for one week, the first week of July. And uh, it was in residence, and it was really um, uh, a microcosm of the university life uh, for first-year students. The other two programs, the GPS, was something that we launched at Guelph, and STEPS was another one that was launched at Conestoga. Once again, the content of those programs were, were quite similar, but, but in terms of addressing the needs and issues of of college versus university students, they, they did have some, uh, some points that were similar, but some differences as well. So in terms of the launch prep, which, which was the summer residential program, it was offered at Guelph, and um, it, it, it program content was quite intense in terms of focusing on personal wellness, academic success, and social connections. There was a strong social uh, component <clears throat> to, to that particular program. Valuations were quite positive. We had 14 students in that in that program, and um, and I can't go through the specifics because of time <clears throat> of the actual data. But certainly there were uh, decreased anxiety was reported, better 
preparation and preparedness for university college life, and a greater degree of confidence in their ability to advocate. Once again, very much uh, course objectives that we, we were looking towards. Some quick slides about anxiety, for example, and the decrease, and uh, uh, comfort level. Once again, you can see from them the graphs that they, they, they are not being a psychologist, and but knowing that there's some, and the, the sample small was small, but there was a definitely reporting of greater comfort, less anxiety, a greater prepared, preparedness. So these were these were very significant data that we we were able to come up with. Confidence with self-advocacy. So once again, uh, all of these were reported both quantitatively and qualitatively. Uh, Margaret's team of um, researchers helped us to devise pre and post tests and uh, evaluations to, in fact, um, move to uh, understand these kind of differences. And uh, we it was very comprehensive, very rigorous. Uh, one of the interesting things about what we found out in terms of the presentations was that the most helpful presentations were those presentations that I would say were geared for a regular uh, student population, time management stress. And less um, helpful were those sessions that were specifically related to mental health issues. So um, uh, that was an interesting finding because we, we asked the question as to that was why were students more focused and one of the conclusions that we come up with over and over is that most of our students with mental health challenges not that they don't want to declare that they have issues is they really want to see themselves as as a part of the regular normal student population so so the emphasis was on those kind of programs and workshops that that, that did that the next two, the next bunch of slides have to do with campus-specific, both the, the, the pre-orientation sessions that were held at both Guelph and Conestoga. Uh, not a lot of time to go into each of these things, but once again, anxiety uh, was, um, was um, uh, with, uh, although it remained high, students felt better prepared, appreciated getting the hands-on experience. That was a big difference between the summer residential program and these pre-orientation. The pre-orientations were far more practical and specific and geared to both either Conestoga or Guelph. Comfort, once again, increased substantially as a result of that. A stigma, interestingly enough, uh, there was no significant decrease in response to stigma, but um, one of the things that did come out is that more and more students were and altogether, we had 65 students in these three programs. They all indicated a more willingness to seek help if needed to be. And um, that, that we found that significant. And that may be because they got to know the resources. They got to meet the staff. They felt more confident, better able to advocate. But um, and certainly, the ability to ask for help was certainly there. Uh, students on the autism spectrum were, were also invited to be part of this, and they were. And one of the overall feelings was this is a population uh, that uh, certainly has different needs. Yes, similar in some ways, but certainly uh, different and needing to be programmed uh, differently. Again, I won't spend a lot of time, don't have a lot of time to talk about the overall participation, but quite positive in terms of anxiety and so forth. Um, practical knowledge, increased preparedness, and all that kind of thing. Um, one of the things that I'd like to spend just a couple minutes on is this work that we did with the high schools. Um, one of the challenges that we have in making the transition, I think it came up earlier in a question for the course, is how do we get students to become aware of what's happening in, in universities, the programs, and so forth. And one of the things we tried to study was the fact that how do we improve communication, how do we improve relationships. And one of the things that we found out is that every board in Ontario, at least, um, I don't know about the other provinces, but they're all structured differently. And the post -second, and the secondary schools have an array of supports. And there is, unlike universities, at least in, in colleges in, in Ontario, there wasn't one point person that we could go to to have this communication with. And so one of the challenges was, was how do we identify a point person. How do we work with high schools to um, 
to to make the trans help students make the transition. Who do we work with? Who do we communicate with? And of course, parents. I know they're involved with students at the university college level, but they are more so, and they are so important in terms of recruitment and and in terms of communicating. So the big issue for us was how do we move in the direction of improving relationships with with secondary schools. Um, one of the recommendations that we came out, if we're going to continue to do this, and we will continue to do this in the next coming year, 2000, and this, this fall and, and subsequent falls, is that we need to work with school boards a lot earlier. And I think each of us are incumbent upon uh, developing relationships with those school boards that we have most of our students actually come from. So in a case for the University of Guelph, we get a lot of students locally. So once again, developing relationships with them. But also, we know school boards in the province where many of our students come from. So we're trying to make an effort of reaching out to those school boards to improve communication. And once again, as a way of telling students about our programs, what we offer, our accessibility services, and for that matter, the course for credit that Margaret talked about. Um, so yeah, in terms of conceptual framework, uh, Emphasizing diagnosis, we found that it may not be a, a helpful thing, and as much as possible, trying to present issues of mental health to this population and in the context of adolescent and young adult developmental theory. I think you are better able to engage students if we move from the, the, um, the mental health, mental illness diagnosis, problem focus to a more normal developmental um, uh, issues makes it much more of a positive and uh, more helpful way of engaging our students. Certainly we felt that um, uh, whereas in the past we would have a pre-orientation for all students regardless of disabilities, we found that, that this is a population like students with learning disabilities that deserve uh, their own pre-orientation summer transition program that is unique to them, that speaks to their needs. Um, recommendations, uh, once again, too many to, to list other than um, um, saying something about the obvious, which is um, that we should be offering these kind of programs, that we need to consult with not only our, our staff, but our students, and students in the high school as to the content of this. And once again, um, introducing content from a developmental perspective is highly recommended. Okay. Great. That okay. Was quick. That was perfect timing. Right at two o'clock. Unfortunately, we won't have time for too many more questions. Um, I hate to shut it down, though, if there are questions out there. So I think everyone should have. Oh, there we go. I think everyone should have at least my contact information, so you can always email me some questions. You should have Margaret and Bruno's as well, if you've accessed any of the handouts, so you can always directly follow up with them. Uh, third option is to access our community practice on the uh, center website and to just um, create, begin, or continue a public conversation around some of the things that have come up. Uh, so thank you very much to both Dr. Margaret Lumley and to Bruno Mancini for um, sharing your very valuable work with us today. Um, sorry we can't take some time to discuss it more in depth, but perhaps we can have you back at this time next year where you can tell us about the next phase. Um, and to all of you, thank you so much for joining our webinar. A couple of quick notes. Um, we are wrapping up our Ask the Experts webinar series for this academic year. Um, so look out for us again in the fall when we'll be starting that up again. Um, and please take some time to complete the evaluation survey, which you should now have in your email. Uh, those are very, very valuable for us in terms of making our webinars better. So thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. And uh, I will take a couple of minutes to exit the webinar. <laughs>